Red Tories, fiscal conservatives, social conservatives, foreign policy conservatives, libertarians, and there are even further distinctions one could note among Canadian Conservatives. As the Conservative Party of Canada prepares to pick a new leader, it might also need to face hard choices between principles and power. With us for their perspectives on the road ahead, in the nation's capital, Garnet Jenis, Conservative MP for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan in Alberta. In New York, New York, Sean Spear, professor at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at U of T. And here in our studio, Jamil Giovanni, Ontario's advocate for community opportunities. Ginny Roth, now Crestview Strategies National Practice Lead for Government Relations, formerly an organizer for Ontario's PC Party. And Ben Woodfinden, doctoral student in political theory at McGill University. And we're delighted to have everybody on our program tonight for this timely discussion about the state of play of the Conservative Party of Canada. And just to start, we thought we might, you know the old expression, you can't tell the players without a program. So here are the eight candidates who have thus far been greenlit to run for the leadership. Let's bring this list up if we can. Marilyn Gladu, who's the MP for Sarnia Lambton since 2015. Rudy Husney. Husney, am I saying that right? That's right. Former political staffer. Jim Carajalios, the anti-carbon tax activist. Leslin Lewis, lawyer, unsuccessful candidate in the 2015 federal election in a Scarborough riding. Peter McKay, former Minister of Justice, Foreign Affairs, National Defense in Stephen Harper's cabinet. Aaron O'Toole, former Minister of Veterans Affairs and the third place finisher last time around. Rick Peterson, a businessman who finished 12th the last time around. And Derek Sloan, who's a rookie MP for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Now that's the list so far, but there's no guarantee that they're all going to make it to the finish line because they still got to collect $300,000 and 3,000 signatures by March 25th. And so far, only Peter McKay has met that threshold. So Garnet, start us off here. Why did the party in its wisdom decide to make the threshold so very much higher this time than last time? Well, I mean, without defending it, I think the logic uh, was that there were so many candidates in the race last time uh, that this wasn't really the time to have uh, people out uh, trying to raise their profile, that we wanted to have a race among people who had a realistic chance of winning uh, so that you could have a little bit of a, a tighter stage and a real good exchange of ideas. Uh, now, at, at this stage, uh, it's still a pretty wide field, but... Uh, I do think that that field is going to narrow, and uh, there are uh, probably two, but at most four people that uh, really uh, have a have a realistic uh, path to uh, you know to being a contender here. Uh, so, so hopefully, we will still have an opportunity to have some some good focused debates between a small number of people. Ginny, was it a case? I mean, that's certainly one explanation I've heard. I wonder if. Part of the other part of the explanation is there are some voices that this party doesn't want to hear. Um, yes, yeah, certainly there are conversations uh, amongst all sorts of people in the party about who should uh, get to say that they're a conservative voice. Um, uh, I think I, I sort of fall on the, on the side of uh, the people who think that as many people as possible should be able to say they have a conservative voice, particularly when we're choosing a leader, right? I mean, parties go through cycles, uh, and the leaderless part of the cycle is in some ways the most exci is exciting, because it's when you get to float new, interesting ideas that maybe people haven't heard before, uh, that aren't as well fleshed out, um, and it's when the party gets to grapple with who it is, which is what you do after you lose an election. <laughs> because when you lose an election, the electorate's telling you uh, you're not connecting uh, with what they want, uh, and maybe you don't have the kind of new ideas that, that would be compelling. So, um, so now is the time to have those conversations, uh, which is why I think we should err on the side of, of being inclusive in terms of who gets to fit into that tent. Once you have a leader, there are all sorts of arguments for why people should fall in line. Mm. Um, but when you don't have a leader, uh, now, now is the time to discuss. So, so I think there are some people in the party who would say, no, um, we, need to, we need a fast track to a leader because if we just, we just fix a couple problems here and there, if we just sort of tape up the boat, it'll be smooth sailing. I, I'm not one of those people. I think we have bigger challenges to contend with. Um, and I think it sort of remains to be seen whether the rules as set allow for that in this debate. So far, I'm not optimistic. Jamil, notable by his absence on that list, is a guy by the name of Richard de Carry, I think is how it's pronounced. Uh, a social conservative who said on a television interview homosexuality was a choice and therefore he was barred from running. No official explanation given, but, I've, you know, I've, everybody's pretty clear that that was the reason why. What do you infer from that, that he's been denied the right to run? 
Well, I do think there's an important distinction to make between candidates who have a genuine effort to get ideas out there versus people who just want to make noise and start fires for the sake of raising their own profile, as Garnett mentioned. That's a real motivation for a lot of people getting involved. Um, my, my view, though, is that political parties historically are some of the last people to get on board to good ideas, right? I mean, a lot of the things that change the world are things that politics are very resistant to at first. And it's people outside of politics that push positive agendas, I think, that make people's lives better. I always look at political parties as often, they want to know who else is coming to your birthday party before they RSVP, right? <laughs> um, so, so in my view, uh, I think it, they, political parties have to be very careful being too close-minded to voices from the outside because I think a lot of people's lives get better because of those voices on the outside. Sean, there's a lot of names on that list, but uh, I'm going to infer from you that there's probably a few more that ought to be there that aren't there. Who'd you like to see on the list that isn't there? I, I think we're all surprised, uh, Steve, with how the, the final list has, has, has shaken, shaken down. We, we, I think most observers anticipated a, a larger number of high-profile candidates, people like uh, Ronna Ambrose, uh, Jean Charest at times was speculated as a candidate. Uh, there are some who, of course, hope that Jason Kenney would return to the national capital. Um, but if I can just pick up something that Ginny said, she, if I can stretch her metaphor of the captain in the boat, uh, this leadership is occurring uh, in, a, in a, a world of intellectual choppy waters. Uh, the, the basic ideas that underpin conservatism are being challenged and, and reconsidered uh, in the United States and really across the Anglosphere. And it, it seems to me it's critical that Canadian conservatives go through that same degree of introspection. What does it mean to be a conservative? What, uh, how does the conservative party or conservative uh, 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 policymakers grapple with the tensions between uh, market economics and, and community and so on? And, and it seems to me thus far, we've not seen that kind of introspection that kind, not that kind of debate. And I, I suspect everyone around the table would agree that it's critical because uh, this isn't just about choosing a leader and taking a run at the next election. It's, it's really coming to define uh, what ideas and what principles and ultimately what policies will animate the Conservative Party of Canada. Ben, do you think the race lacks that kind of introspection? Yeah, I haven't seen... Um, candidates are obviously putting forward um, what they think of as, what they're, what they're suggesting your ideas, but there's been no kind of real reflection on, um, like Sean was saying, this kind of an introspection about what it means to be a Conservative. Um, part, the party, obviously, in the last election didn't connect with voters in the way that it hoped to. Um, Even though it, it got the most votes. Yes, and, um, but I think um, Conservatives, in some sense, as a, a Conservative party, they're going to win when they put forward a compelling vision of what that means. Right, and so if there isn't a compelling uh, vision behind what what the party is trying to, uh, what they're trying to sell, it's probably going to fall flat at doors. And from people I know that worked on campaigns, um, that was this that was the the hint I got that um, people just were not enthusiastic about it. So the, the the usual people turned out to vote for the for the party, but it was not a it was not an enthusiastic vote for a lot of people by any stretch. Garnet, do you as a member of parliament do you regret the fact that so far anyway there doesn't seem to be a um, oh, I don't know, like a huge ideological debate about the soul of the Conservative Party, at least at this juncture? Well, I think we are going to see substantive ideological uh, debates happening as part of the leadership race. Uh, you know, but, but when we're still at the stage of people organizing and, and getting ready and of the race kind of falling out, uh, it's not really a time when uh, that clash is going to be as pronounced. Uh, th there, there are going to be official debates with likely a smaller number of candidates where, where that will happen. I mean, I take the point about the importance of us uh, being introspective and asking these big questions about the balance between, say, communitarian values and, and liberty. Uh, these, are, these are important questions, but I think at the same time, what, what people generally expect from leaders is for them to have completed the process of introspection and be articulating their particular vision for the way forward. So that introspection needs to happen. The, the debates we're going to see in the leadership race are going to be uh, are going to involve people putting forward strong, clearly articulated ideas about where we should go. I hope. I mean, I, I, I've made a choice in the leadership race. I'm sporting Aaron O'Toole, uh, and I think he's he's well positioned to articulate the balance we need to strike uh, on that. And others will support their candidates in the approach that uh, that they're taking. Uh, it's still early days. I'm optimistic about this race. Uh, Hopefully, things will pan out the right way. We'll see where it goes. Nothing against that, Ginny, but, you know, at the end of the day, political parties are supposed to pick a leader yeah. who can win. And ultimately, you don't get to do any of the things ideologically or otherwise unless you win. So 
Um, I guess I'm wondering, are you overthinking all of this? No, we're not. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm not willing to give up. No, but just because the cycles of politics are what they are, I'm not willing to give up um, the introspection that we're all talking about. So um, other countries do a better job, other Western countries in particular, uh, do a better job um, that I'm thinking of, do a better job of in parallel uh, all sorts of different things. You know, you have your your training and your party apparatus that, that selects candidates and get, gets ready for an election and recruits volunteers. Um, you have your, um, you know, your members of parliament and your um, and your leader's office who who uh, debate the other parties in the and the House of Commons and start to stake up positions. And then, ideally, you should have all sorts of forums for this introspective discussion and these sort of floating of ideas and discussing of ideas and um, and having really really thoughtful, uh, really deep debates. Uh, whether that's think tanks or forums and conferences. Um, and in some times, some cases, that's attached to the political party, uh, the Conservative Party of Canada, or, or whatever provincial party you may want to. But sometimes it's not, and and we have some of that in Canada. We do have think tanks. We have uh, the Manning Conference that's coming up in a few weeks. We have other um, forums for these kinds of discussions, uh, but we don't have nearly enough, and we don't have nearly as much as as the United States um, or the UK. So what you're seeing in the United States and the UK, and I think Sean um, kind of referenced this, is um, there is a big reckoning. Uh, and a big um, discussion about uh, what is conservatism, the sort of the three-legged stool of Ronald Reagan and um, uh, what some people are calling um, uh, the broken or the, the dead consensus uh, about the labels that you mentioned uh, as we got started, uh, which really just don't seem up to describing um, uh, where people fit and how to approach the challenges of today. So I hope we'll get into that um, today. I think we will. Um, but that, that, that has to exist. There needs to be a forum for those discussions. I hear somebody out of town trying to get in. On that, Steve? Please, go ahead, Sean. Yeah, uh, I, I, I think that ideas in politics are not in tension here, and it's especially important um, if, at, at this precise juncture, if I can, uh, at the risk of philosophizing for a second, <laughs> uh, as Jenny says, uh, North American conservatism for the past half century or so has really been animated by what can be described as fusionism, uh, which is, in effect, an intellectual and political alliance between libertarians, those who um, place an emphasis on liberty, on the market economy, and traditional conservatives who place a greater emphasis on, um, on in some cases, religious values or traditional values or ultimately communitarianism. And the reason these two forces came together uh, in the middle of the 20th century was um, because they shared a common enemy uh, in the Soviet Union. Um, the Soviet Union communism represented a threat both to liberty and to traditional uh, a traditional point of view and fusionism has, for all intents and purposes, been the underlying idea that's held conservatism together in the United States, uh, in the United Kingdom, and in Canada, even if uh, our politicians don't talk in the, in the language of fusionism. Uh, I think for a whole host of reasons, as Ginny says, the, um, the arrangement uh, of fusionism uh, is uh, uh, started to show its wear, uh, the end of the Cold War, uh, and a whole host of other factors, including the rise of globalization, um, uh, increasing secularization in our society, uh, and so on, has um, people on both sides of this arrangement asking themselves if it still makes sense, both as an intellectual and, and political framework. That is why there's so much turmoil in the world of conservatism these days. Uh, and, and in some ways, uh, it's caused um, uh, political disruption in the form of Donald Trump and others. But for those of us who are interested in conservative ideas, um, it's an exciting time. It's a chance to revisit some of these first principle assumptions that have guided conservative ideas and conservative politics. And, and it seems to me it's, it's at this precise juncture that Canadian conservatives need to be asking themselves these questions uh, to, to, to try to make a judgment about uh, what to prioritize, uh, what ideas uh, to, to um, disseminate and, and to, to advance uh, conservative policymaking and politics in Canada. In which case, to that end, let me read a couple of quotes here that will, I think, propel our discussion along. Uh, the first is from the aforementioned Aaron O'Toole, who Garnet Genesis is supporting. And he says, I don't think we go to the middle. I think that's what another opponent in this race will be suggesting. We just go to the slight right of Justin Trudeau. That's not the answer for me. I think we need ideas for the future. And then Andrew McDougall, the former director of communications for Stephen Harper, wrote this, hoping to get John Baird to jump into the race. Of course, he ultimately didn't, but Andrew wrote, run. So this stale conservative leadership race gets the shake up it so desperately needs. Run, so we can move beyond all of this insipid who is a real conservative navel-gazing nonsense. Run, so we can have, gasp, a bit of fun. 
discussing the future of the Conservative Party of Canada. Ben, let's get into this. Is this um, too much a debate about uh, a return to power versus who's in what ideological lane and all of that business? Well, I don't think, I don't think there's, um, you necessarily have to make uh, a choice there, a binary choice. Um, obviously, um, if you want to actually implement any kind of uh, vision or any kind of uh, substantive ideas, you're going to have to be in government to do that. Um, but that doesn't mean that power for, power for its own sake is probably something, a party that seeks power purely, purely to govern is not a party that in my mind deserves to govern, um, especially a conservative party. Sure. So um, if a conservative party wants to govern, presumably it wants to govern because it has a kind of a sense of what a conservative government would look like rooted in some sort of fundamental principles or understanding of what that means. Um, so I think the two have to be wedded and obviously there has to be um, the real world politics is not the same thing as kind of abstract philosophizing. Uh, but I think something, something that uh, conservatives have at their disposal is that uh, a kind of classic conservative virtue is prudence. Uh, and prudence and pragmatism are not the same thing. And that prudence is a kind of, um, an, a kind of an, an understanding and an accepting that you have to adapt to your circumstances. Uh, and so I think a bit of prudence needs to be applied there in kind of understanding what, as uh, Sean was saying, what, uh, what, what needs to be reimagined to make conservatism relevant again. Like, Jamil, apropos of what Ben just said and what Sean just said, do you think there is a generally agreed upon understanding of what it means to be a conservative in Canada at this point in the 21st century? No, I don't believe so. And I think the best example of that is that there are a lot of people who are conservative culturally, they have conservative values, they're religious people of various backgrounds. Uh, who do not see themselves in a conservative political party. Um, those, to be a conservative and to be a big C political conservative are not the same thing. And I think that's actually a challenge the party should be taking on, is why is it that if you look at polling data, if you look at uh, what, what priorities and issues animate a lot of Canadians, conservatives should actually have a broader reach than they actually do have. And I think that's because there are a lot of yeah. people who just don't see the conservative party as a vehicle for their own self-interest, whether that's because of discrimination, past prejudice, or simply just an, an unwillingness to speak to people who might have a, come from, into politics from a different angle uh, than what is assumed to be a conservative party member or conservative voter. Mm. So that is a real concern that I have because all this, you know, thinking about ideas and reflection and all that, from my view, if it's all about dealing with the same people over and over mm. again, then I'm not interested in that, right? I mean, over a third of Canadians didn't even vote in last year's election. I want to know why. I want to know what those people think. And I want to know if the Conservative Party should have a unique value proposition for that population. But if it's just a matter of debating between these small circles of very, very few Canadians who actually vote in, uh, you know, for a leader of a political party, and then very few Canadians, in some parts of the country at least, who identify with the Conservative Party, if we're only worrying about what those folks are thinking, then I think it's, you, you probably lost a lot, the next election before it even starts. <laughs> Garnet, are, is there a reason why, in your view, there are Conservatives in this country who don't see a place for themselves in the current Conservative Party of Canada? So I think uh, Jamil's comments uh, really hit it out of the park on, on that issue. Um, let, let, let's start by saying, what, what does it mean to be a conservative? For, for me, a conservative value set believes in the importance of strong families, strong communities, and resilient individuals, uh, what David Cameron called the big society, uh, as an alternative to uh, structural government-oriented solutions in all aspects of our lives. But it's not limited government as an end in and of itself. It's it's resilient individuals, strong families, strong communities as the goal, uh, as an alternative uh, to, uh, to believing that changing the structure and the system will address uh, the problems that exist. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, 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 these ideas, the primacy of culture over politics, uh, these, these, these conservative ideas are generally appealing, uh, but I think we need to apply them across the board. You know, we understand the, the primacy of, of culture over politics in, in general, uh, but then when it comes to interaction with certain communities, maybe we we miss that point or we don't we don't emphasize it enough. Some of it is engagement and dialogue. Some of it is uh, showing people that we we are listening to their particular concerns. Um, you know, Canada is a country, I believe, that is made up of, of 
a, a very diverse set of conservatives. You have conservative Francophone Quebecers that want to preserve uh, their culture. Uh, you have uh, conservative uh, immigrant communities that want to uh, preserve the, the, the values that, that animate their lives, family, community, culture. Uh, you have conservative people in Western Canada who are particularly concerned about uh, the identity and the economy of Western Canada. So the, the struggle for different kinds of conservatives who are who are attached to the particularities of their own cultures and traditions is to build a, a unifying uh, political party that includes all of those different uh, particulars. Uh, it's, a, it's a challenging uh, task, but there is so much philosophically that unites all of those different groups uh, and, uh, and emphasizing uh, th th those values of family, of community, of individual resilience, I think is, is uh, politically useful, uh, but it also reflects where, what we actually believe. I think it's, it's very saleable and I think it reflects reality. Jenny, the, I, I think the conservatism that I knew growing up was essentially championing smaller government, lower taxes, more trade, robust foreign policy, uh, you know, being good to your allies. Small L liberalism, in other words. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I mean, yeah, de certainly. define it how you want, but is certainly. that not conservatism anymore? Um, I think that's part of conservative. And there are certainly conservatives who would describe um, their, you know, that's sort of a libertarian, liberal mm -hmm. um, perspective, you know, wing of the conservative party. And there are people who would describe their views that way. Um, but when, when Sean was talking about some of what's happened globally, um, and how our, our global economics have changed, and our geopolitics have changed. Uh, in, increasingly, uh, and voters are telling this around the world, the consensus, um, which isn't really a conservative consensus, it's sort of a conservative liberal um, consensus uh, that liberalism and liberal economics are the answer uh, for everything, um, is failing. And, and we're seeing that um, uh, with the election of Donald Trump and Boris Johnson, obviously in Canada, um, it's manifested itself a little bit differently, but you know, if, if you poll, uh, if, if you ask people to vote on um, on, low, on on reducing deficits, um, that is not a compelling um, a reason why someone mm -hmm. should should vote for um, an elected official. And we're seeing that actually Canadians are quite toler tolerant of deficits if they feel that government is investing in them and their lives are getting better. And so uh, a sort of a fiscal conservatism um, that might have been popular, uh, frankly, when Paul Martin delivered it in the, in the 1990s is, is just not um, something that we can take to voters, along with the sort of Christmas tree of the ornaments that speak to all the different... Um, uh, groups within the party that Garnet talks about, um, cobbling that together is not enough to get to a win, um, and it's not enough to speak to a conservative vision that people um, uh, can get behind in the way that Jamil's describing, trying to actually bring new people into the party who can feel at home. And so I think we have to get into um, what is a compelling, coherent response to changing geopolitical factors, changing um, economics uh, that don't rely on, um, on, on what worked when you were growing up, Steve, um, uh, and, and, and when I was growing up too, um, uh, that worked really up until quite recently. Uh, we can't we can't rely on that um, as the answer. And some people are doing some really interesting. The gentleman named Orrin Cass in the United States who's doing some really good We've work. We've got him on the show. Oh, good. Yeah, yep. um, uh, he's doing some really interesting work to start to define what might be the answer um, that that brings in an econ economic consideration, a social consideration, um, and it really speaks to people thriving. Um, and it speaks to, I think, something that could be compelling to all the groups that Garnet described. But we haven't even, I, I don't think, begun the work in Canada of, of getting into that yet. Well, again, apropos of, of when I was growing up in this province, the Red Tories were in ascension and, in fact, governed Ontario for 42 straight years. And I want to ask you, Ben, about the Red Tories because you, you've written about these guys, right? Mm -hmm. um, the Red Tories in which you suggest our contemporary understanding of what it stands for is inferior to what it stood for originally. Let's get our heads around that. Explain, if you would. Well, I think that the term today is essentially used as a pejorative, right? It tends to, it tends to be an insult thrown Only by conservatives. Only by, yes, <laughs> only by conservatives uh, to people who, um, you know, they, they claim to be fiscally conservative but socially liberal. Uh, and then they often tend to be uh, not socially liberal but not fiscally conservative as well. <laughs> so it's essentially a kind of, I would say, a watered-down kind of liberal light version of what it means to be conservative. And then I, I would say that there is an older tradition of, uh, of red Toryism in Canada that's actually, um, the red part of that is actually, uh, it's not a, a liberal red, it's a kind of, uh, not, not quite a socialist red, but it's a, it's a conservatism that takes the state seriously. Uh, and if I can go back to what, uh, what, what you were saying uh, just before, I think there's a, there's a difference between small government and limited government. I think most conservatives would say that they believe in 
limited government, but there's a, the difference there is that a limited government is a, a, ref, a, a one that's got a narrow, it knows what it's supposed to do and it does it and it's good at doing it and it has a kind of a capacity to execute its end, to get what it needs to get done, uh, versus small government, which tends to be a kind of, often a kind of uh, a night watchman state almost, that's never obviously going to actually, actually be created, but it, um, it means conservatives end up not taking the state as seriously as I think they should. Mm. I want to ask Sean about this because uh, you could argue that red Tories have been sort of in the political wilderness in Ontario for maybe 25 years. Um, you know, that Mike Harris essentially took over the party and made it more of a quote unquote reformatory uh, kind of party. And then, of course, ever since Stephen Harper took over the federal conservative party, the, if you like, Peter McKay wing, the pro old progressive conservative red Tory party, uh, has also been sort of in the wilderness as well. Those people think this may be their moment, that if McKay wins, a return to more pragmatic, centrist, moderate, progressive conservatism could be upon us. Is that a good thing or a bad thing in your view? <laughs> They may be right. Uh, I, I would say, though, as uh, Steve, as Ben says, that uh, red Toryism, as it's advanced by um, by some of the people you're describing, uh, strikes me as is just a couple of shades uh, to to the it defines itself as just being a few degrees to the to the left of uh, of mainstream conservatism. I think red Toryism is a much more textured worldview. That I think at, at this precise moment, given the political and economic and cultural uncertainties uh, in Canada and elsewhere uh, could find uh, a, a resonance. Um, but I'm not sure um, there's anyone uh, in our public life, with the exception of Ben, perhaps, who's uh, <laughs> in a position to articulate that textured worldview. Um, you mentioned, Steve, uh, uh, Mr. Harris and others uh, who I think have uh, come to define conservatism for the past uh, quarter century or so. Uh, they came up at a particular moment. Uh, when uh, a series, uh, when an overreach of government, uh, large-scale deficit spending, mm -hmm. uh, a heavy regulatory state, um, large instances of uh, public ownership, and so on, necessitated uh, what was, for all intents and purposes, a libertarian response, um, um, pruning the size of government, reducing the burden of high taxation on individuals and entrepreneurs, and so on. Uh, there's a tendency, I think, amongst conservatives, both intellectuals and uh, members of the political class, to think of the, the political uh, and policy responses to that particular set of uh, conditions and circumstances in the 1980s and 90s as representing the totality, totality of conservatism, as if uh, that's a fixed set of solutions that applies in every circumstance. The truth is, in 2020, the circumstances have changed markedly. The biggest challenges our society is facing is not uh, an overreach in government. Uh, uh, it's really about uh, creating economic opportunity uh, for those without post-secondary qualifications. It's about uh, dealing with regional economic disparity um, between uh, dynamic urban spaces in the country that ha are facing deindustrialization. It's about creating opportunity for some of the people that uh, Jamil uh, referred to earlier and, and with whom he works so closely. And so it seems to me uh, the future of conservatism is uh, shaking um, this tendency to think about conservatism as frozen uh, in the 1980s and, um, and developing practical solutions through the application of conservative first principles to the, to the challenges facing uh, Canada in the, in the 2020s. Uh, it seems to me if that's what this leadership was about, not only would the winner come out um, uh, in, a, in a better position, uh, it, would, it would be in the interest of the country because conservative ideas are good. Um, conservative ideas, I would argue, are right. Um, but it seems, to, it seems to me the onus is on us uh, to get out and to tell Canadians uh, what those ideas are and how they're going to be applied uh, in the service of the challenge facing um, people in, in all parts of the country. Well, let me introduce a couple of other voices to the conversation here. And this is a view from the left of the right, or at least of the current state of the current Conservative Party of Canada. Here's Frank Graves and Michael Valpe writing in McLean's magazine not too long ago, saying, it's the face of authoritarian populism that is largely driving the new conservatism in Canada. Traditional progressive conservatives may yearn for the status quo of conservatism of yore. The new base looks more like Trumpian populists than the Red Tories of the Charest era. While Northern populism may be a little less florid in Canada, it is essential 
to the current Conservative Party. Garnett, you want to weigh in on that? Are they right? Well, I, like, look, Frank Graves is a regular donor to the Liberal Party, uh, and he regularly encourages, uh, uh, you know, greater greater divisiveness with what I would argue are methodologically bad polls about people's view of race in this country. I don't I don't think uh, what Frank Graves, frankly, should be saying it should be taken that that seriously. I I, I did want to just comment on the question of red Tories. If if the red the textured red Tory philosophy is going to inform our political debates, likely it's going to be called something uh, something different. Um, but let, let's let make this concrete. An issue like criminal justice. Criminal justice uh, reform is an issue being championed by the Trump administration. Uh, few would consider Trump as being on the left of his party, uh, but he's taken a very thoughtful approach to criminal justice, recognizing uh, individual resilience, trying to reduce costs, trying to get people out of prison who really don't need to be there anymore. I, I've written uh, recently trying to sort of stimulate a more nuanced conversation around criminal justice and sentencing here in Canada, where you have Peter McKay, supposedly the more progressive candidate, uh, who's, who's really doubling down on a, uh, on a you know, you got to take your last breath uh, in prison if you get a life sentence uh, sort of approach to this. So uh, the, the conversations, as, as has been pointed out, are, are often much uh, uh, much richer, and the and the desire to place people on sort of an arbitrary right-left spectrum within uh, within the the party doesn't doesn't really work. I think I think thoughtful red Tories should be advocating for a more limited role for government for criminal justice reform uh, and recognizing the greater role that civil society uh, organizations can can play in responding to some of the challenges we face, rather than at all uh, falling on government. So uh, so I, I'm hoping for that richer conversation to come out more. Well, Jamil, go ahead. Yeah, I just like to comment. <laughs> And on that quote that tried to paint conservative politics as authoritarian uh, of some sort from from McLean's magazine. It's the face of authoritarian populism that is driving the new conservatism in Canada. Say these two. Yeah, and I think that's just, it's a great example of like the kind of fear mongering that gets used around conservative politics to begin with. Like I I really believe that on many really important uh, public policy issues around education, uh, freedom of speech. Uh, uh, post-secondary reform, job creation, conservatives are actually the the countercultural response to the status quo. If you're a community where the education system hasn't served you well for decades, it's actually conservatives that are offering something different. Liberal and NDP political philosophy is basically the status quo on many really big important issues that stand in the way of greater social mobility for Canadians experiencing poverty and working class disadvantages. So from my point of view, when I hear people use this kind of fear-mongering language, like conservative politics, it's, it has some only negative presence in the world. I just think that that's people trying to preserve whatever advantage they have in, in convincing large swaths of the population, including the communities that I work in and come from, that the only way for us to have a political voice is to depend on Liberals and NDP. Well, yeah. let me do a follow-up with you on uh, uh, related to those communities that you serve. Uh, immigration. Let's talk immigration. Because according to ECOS, and I know, you know, Garnet may not love their polls, but anyway, let's <laughs> do one here anyway. The incidence of yeah, conservative they, voters... They were the reason Bernier was included in the debate, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the incidence of conservative voters who think Canada is admitting, quote-unquote, too many visible minorities as immigrants has increased from 47% to 70%. Now, these are conservative voters surveyed comparing yeah. 2012 with today. It's gone from 47% to 70%. What do you infer from that? Sure. So I'm, I'm not going to take uh, at face value the numbers that are presented there, but I will address the, like, the, the core issue, right, which is, is it reasonable to have a political debate about the immigration, right? How many people are in the country, where those people live, all those sorts of things. I do think it's a reasonable thing to discuss, right? And I think many people who are the children of immigrants or who are immigrants themselves to this country mm -hmm. would share that view with me. Where I think it becomes a problem is when we start to treat immigration with hostility, as if people coming into this country cannot equally and meaningfully participate, mm -hmm. which is exactly where the whole uh, debate around Bill 21 in Quebec becomes a source of concern for me. Mm -hmm. Because what we see are minority groups coming into this country asking to be equal citizens with equal rights, 
rights and then being told actually these laws don't apply to you, our rights don't apply to you, our charter rights and freedoms, our constitution doesn't apply to you. That's an issue. And that's why you won't hear me expressing support for any of the candidates to be leader of the party right now. Because I actually am not clear on who wants to really support fundamental freedoms for everyone mm -hmm. in this country. It's I actually think there are a lot of people trying to go half step, right? I don't know if that's a good political word, but <laughs> where I come from we call it half stepping, right? Where you say, <laughs> oh, you know, I'm gonna pretend that I care about this thing, but I'm not gonna actually stand by it with any sort of principle or uh, or, or strength, right? And that that's that's more my concern. So I will not accept the idea that conservatives are by by nature more racist than anyone else, but I will say that conservatives, if they want to dispel that kind of uh, what I would call perhaps propaganda, they should probably have to, to defend some sort of equal opportunity for people of all backgrounds and show that they're not racist. Well, can I can I ask the uh, the shadow critic for multiculturalism what he thinks about all this? Uh, Garnet, the, um, what, what, sure, what's your view about sure, the, yeah. increasing, the apparent increasing, increasing number of conservative supporters who are not all that crazy about multiculturalism? So, so look, I, I dug into those p poll results, right? I mean, those are, if I remember right, I'm fairly sure I, I do, uh, these were interactive voice response polls for landline telephones, uh, which means that you get, a, you get a call on your landline telephone, which you probably don't have one, and you say two questions, do you think there's too many visible minorities in this country? Now, if I get a call like that, I'm going to say, who is this crank who's phoning me asking an inherently racist question, and I'm going to hang up the phone? Uh, like, I, I think there's, there's plenty of space for for uh, the the uh, more neutral, thoughtful pollsters in this country to analyze the questions of how uh, different Canadians are uh, are looking at issues around multiculturalism. Uh, but I would just completely dismiss uh, as as methodologically suspect. Uh, and and we know what place they're coming from, given uh, given the history of the Ecos uh, principle with the the Liberal Party. Um, and and look, I mean, they, they their their polling was the basis for saying that the People's Party uh, had a, a realistic shot at winning some seats and therefore Bernier's inclusion in the debate. So, uh, you know, I, I think what frustrates conservatives uh, is that a sense that, you know, wh why, are, why are so many institutions relying on this kind of data? Uh, you know, c conservatives uh, are, are inclusive, open-hearted people who happen to believe that strong communities, strong families, limited government uh, are better solutions to the challenges, uh, challenges that we face. Uh, and look, I, I think our party is incredibly open to people of a wide variety of, of uh, uh, you know, of, of, of different backgrounds, and we try to build a common sense of civic nationalism that is uh, pan-ethnic, pan-religious, and includes people from different uh, linguistic backgrounds. That has always been our history. That has been our strength, uh, and I think that's you know supported by the desires of members. And you would see that in uh, in, in more serious, uh, methodologically uh, less suspect polling. Okay, Ginny, I've only got a few minutes left here. And I do want to ask about the role of social conservatives in the Conservative sure. Party today. We know that when Patrick Brown was leader of the Ontario Progressive yep. Conservatives, his view was, I'm not going to pander to social conservatives anymore if they don't like my positions on issues. It's they can leave the party. when you run for leader, but yeah. <laughs> right. After, well, okay, fair point. Uh, what about today? How much, quote unquote, pandering of social conservative views do you think this party needs to do today? So part, part, I'll go back to this labels problem. Um, I consider myself a social conservative, but I'm, but I, but m the, the things that I get fixated on are not what a lot of um, what we would traditionally call socially conservatives for the last number of years are, get fixated on. I'm not really um, interested in discussing gay marriage. Um, I think life questions are important, but I think that the full spectrum of life questions are important, not just the, the single issue of abortion. Um, I, I believe in rootedness. I believe in communities. I believe in strong families. I believe in um, community organizations that support um, people and, and lead to successful outcomes. And I think that's true for the majority of Canadians, frankly, not just conservatives. Um, so should there be a room for people who um, who care about that that in the Conservative Party? 100%. Should there also be room um, for, for debates about some of those single issue questions and really, really thoughtful debates about what, what role the state should play when it comes to um, to people's lives, the end of their lives and the beginning of their lives. Um, we have to have room for those those kinds of debates. Um, uh, or, or a party is not a, a full spectrum party that, that can represent an offering to all Canadians. So I feel really strongly about that. Um, and I think that this leadership process um, and any sort of grassroots uh, uh, conversation amongst the party will, will prove that um, a sort of simple rejection of a, a huge swath of not just the party, like I said, but Canadians, uh, will be a, a failing proposition for a political party. Ben, the way that Tom Flanagan put it when he wrote 
he wrote the following. He said, really, the Harper playbook is the way to go here. Keep social conservatives on side without letting them write the policy book or allowing a ruinous hot button issue to dominate the news. His quote. Is that the way to go? Well, I think it's half true in that um, far too often conservatives let themselves be defined by, by the other side, right? Um, and social conservatism is the kind of the ground zero of that. And I would echo what Ginny was saying, that, that there, is a, there, there, there is a vision of what it means to be a social, conservatism, a, a social conservative that isn't just focused on a couple of uh, hot button issues. And I, I dislike the kind of the, the bifurcation by, that, that allows people to exclude social conservatives by just focusing on a couple of issues. And I think a more a holistic understanding of conservatism focuses on not just social issues, but the social as a kind of as a realm, so families, communities, um, things like that. So I think what conservatives actually need to do is articulate a vision of social conservatism so that they aren't just being defined by, defined by the other side and then allowing the other side to, uh, to, to, announce, to just continue to move the goalposts on what's acceptable. Uh, if conservatives can kind of articulate a vision of social conservatism that doesn't, that I, would, I think I would say also is kind of a, a silent majority view for lots of Canadians, I think they can kind of, they can deal with that issue uh, that way completely. Terrific. That's our time tonight here on TVO, everybody. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Garnet Jenis, the MP from Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Sean Spear from the Monk School of Global Affairs. Jamil Giovanni, Ontario's advocate for community opportunities. And can I say how happy I am to see you looking so healthy. Thank you. You've been Appreciate fighting it. cancer for the last here, here. couple of years, and yeah. amen to you. Thank you. Looking good. Appreciate it. Ginny Roth uh, from Crestview Strategy, Ben Woodfinden uh, from McGill University. It's great to have you all on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.